Hey there! Welcome to our beginner series for V-Ray for 3DS Max designed to help you get started with the product and start rendering in no time. In this video, I'm going to show you how to post-process your image inside the V-Ray frame buffer so you can achieve stunning results in no time. To follow along, download our project files from the link in the video description and you can try out everything we're doing on your own time. Now let's get started. Before we start rendering, we have to set up a few things to make sure we have enough information for our post-processing work. That means we need to add some render elements. Go to the render setup, open the render element, and then add it back to beauty. This adds a group of render elements, which are all the individual elements that make up the beauty pass. Let's also add a crypto mat, which will automatically give us masks for all objects in our scene. We'll use these masks later to adjust individual objects during post-processing. Lastly, we're going to add a V-Ray light mix render element, which will help us tweak the lighting of individual objects in post-production. Now that we have all our render elements in place, it's time to render our image. Great, now we've got our rendered image. Let's see how we can post-process it to make it even better. If you want to follow along without rendering, you can open the image from the project files. Just go to File, and then Load Image in the V-Ray Frame Buffer. You can also load the image using the VFB History feature. If you don't see the Layers menu on the VFB, you can press Ctrl plus L on your keyboard to bring it up. First, we can fix the areas of the image that are overexposed. There are several ways to do this, but the easiest way is to add a new Filmic Tone Map layer. This automatically compresses the highlights without losing detail and also adds some nice contrast to the image. You can try out different types to see which one suits your image best and adjust it as needed. Next, let's add a curves layer. We can carefully adjust the handles to slightly boost the midtones. This will make the image overall slightly brighter without overexposing the highlights or shadows. If it's too much, you can always reduce the opacity of the layer. A value of 0 means the layer won't affect the image, while a value of 1 means it'll have a full effect. Also note, each layer can change its blending mode, which determines how the layer blends with the one below it. Now we see that our image has a warm tint. We can fix this with the white balance layer. Just add it on top of our other layers. Then we can use the picker and click on a pixel in the frame buffer that we think should be white, like these pillows. This will adjust the image's colors, so the pillows actually appear white. We can also add the color balance layer and use it to grade the colors of the shadows, midtones, and highlights separately. This way, we can easily change the overall mood of the image. I'll add a lookup table layer for some additional color corrections. Now we can load some LUT files and see how they affect our image. You can find these files online or create your own using different color grading applications or from the VFB itself. When you click on this icon, it'll show you a list of all the LUT files in that folder. You can hover over any of them to quickly check how it'll change your image's colors. Once you've chosen one, remember that you can always lower its opacity if the effect is too strong. Now let's use the crypto mat we added earlier. For instance, we can use it to color correct only the pillows. Let's add an exposure layer. Right click on it. Add a crypto mat mask. And then click on the pick icon and select the pillows from the render. You can check your selection by clicking on the show preview and selected button. If you've selected something by mistake, use the pick minus option and click on the object you want to remove from the selection. With the mask in place, we can make changes to the exposure layer, and it will only affect the selected objects. As a general rule, if you're adjusting the exposure, you might want to do it before adding the filmic tone layer, as it might lead to strange results. Feel free to experiment and make any additional adjustments to other objects. As you might remember, we added a light mix render element earlier. 
Let's see how we can use that. To start, switch to the light mix mode in the frame buffer. Now you can see a list of all the lights in the scene. From here, we can adjust the intensity and color of each light in real time. For example, we can tweak the skylight without affecting the sun hotspots. This way we can very easily make the scene brighter without overexposing the sunny parts or just the sun separately. As you can see, we have a lot of control over our image. So, for example, we can turn this day image into a night one very easily. Let's start off by lowering the intensity of the sun quite a bit, and maybe make it light colder as if it's being cast by the moon. We can also tone down the sky a bit and make a few adjustments to the rest of the lights. The scene has a variety of different lights, so you can experiment and create some interesting results. But be careful not to increase the multiplier too much, as it can result in visible noise in your image. Once we're satisfied with our image, let's explore the composite section of the frame buffer. Note that if you switch to the composite section, the changes we've made in the light mix won't be transferred. This is because we're using the back to beauty approach, which reconstructs the image by adding together its individual components, or the beauty render elements. As you can see, we have a stack of them and we can control each one individually. For example, we can go to the global illumination layer and increase its multiplier. Or we can color correct only the reflection element, making the objects more or less reflective. If you want this effect to happen only on certain objects, you can use masks. With the reflection render element selected, let's add an exposure layer to it. Notice how the exposure layer appears on top of it with an arrow, indicating that it will only affect the render element below it. Let's add a crypto matte mask to it and pick some objects. We've seen before that you can add a mask by right-clicking on the layer and selecting it from there. Alternatively, you can click on this icon and add a mask from here. Now if we increase the exposure value, the object will become more reflective, and by decreasing it, it'll remove the reflection from these specific objects. What if we want more control over our image using the light mix? We can return to the light mix and click the composite button. You'll see that our render element stack looks a bit different and we don't have control over the reflections or global illumination. Even if we add a beauty render element such as lighting, you'll see that the sunlight is still there even if we've turned it off. This is because the light mix and back to beauty options don't work at the same time. If you want to use the image you've created with the light mix and also control each render element, you need to apply all the changes you made in the light mix back to the scene. So let's hit the scene button. This will erase your light mix outcome. But when you render again, you'll find that the changes are now permanently in the render. Once the image is rendered, we can head straight to the composite and make some adjustments there. Now, you can correctly work with the back to beauty render elements. For example, we can tweak the specular a bit and play with the global illumination. As you can see, the V-Ray frame buffer gives us a lot of control and you can dramatically enhance your raw image using its tools. Finally, let's add some lens effects to give some nice bloom and glare to our image, which will soften the brightest parts. We can also add some sharpening to bring out the fine details of the image. When we're happy with our image, we can save it using the save icon. It's a good idea to save your image as a PNG because it maintains the image quality and is easy to share.
You can also save your render in the VFB history, which will save it in a floating point format and keep all the render elements. This way, you can load an image from the history later and make any adjustments in the frame buffer. If the buttons in the History tab appear grayed out, you can access the VFB settings by pressing the S key on your keyboard. Then, go to the History section and enable it. If the Use Project Path option is on, all the images will be saved in a folder named VFB underscore History, located where your 3DS Max project is set. You can deselect this and manually choose a location to store the images. Now let's look at one last feature of the VFB. Head over to the Collaboration tab and click the button. To upload your image, you'll need to create a project to store your image. Now you can view your render in the browser. Here, you can rename it, add comments and annotations, and send it to other people, even those who aren't users, for review. You can also get a link to share with others. This is an excellent way to share your work with clients and co-workers. This wraps up our tutorial. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. By now, you should know how to use the many post-processing tools the V-Ray Frame Buffer offers and get impressive results. Be sure to check out the rest of our Getting Started videos for V-Ray for 3DS Max or check our blog and documentation for more product tips and tricks. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. See you soon!